On the 8th of August 1969, the Manson family, a Californian cult headed by the notorious Charles Manson, committed arguably their most infamous and heinous crime, after entering the home of heavily pregnant actress Sharon Tate and brutally murdering the five people inside. This, along with various other acts of violence committed by the family, sparked a nationwide sensation, and they've subsequently gone down in history as possibly the most bizarre and twisted group of people in recent memory. Two years after this horrific event, Ed Sanders released the Charles Manson biography, aptly titled The Family, which contains the first documented example of the now commonplace rumour that the Manson family were involved in the making of snuff movies, in which they filmed their actual murders. Although only a rumour, this added yet another macabre layer to the already harrowing story, and it went on to almost single-handedly start the modern mythology of the snuff film. Nowadays, with the advent of the internet, there's seemingly no end to the barrage of disturbing content that can be accessed. But back in 1972, when all of this was fresh in people's minds, a young filmmaker was inspired to create what is still considered to be one of the most frightening and deranged pieces of underground cinema ever made. A movie shrouded in mystery and rumours just as fascinating as the piece itself. Let's talk about The Last House on Dead End Street. While the world was in shock at the events unfolding, Roger Watkins was in his early 20s and studying English literature at the State University of New York College at Oneonta. He, like everyone else, was fascinated and appalled in equal measure as the truth about the Manson family was brought to light, and having read the aforementioned biography, he was struck by the thought of retelling the story on film. This obscure idea was even suggested to him by a major film distributor after attending a meeting with them on behalf of friend and director Nicholas Ray, responsible for the classic Rebel Without a Cause. This was at a point in time when very few filmmakers had the nerve to go all out with horror. There are of course some fantastic exceptions, but in 1972, pre-Exorcist, Halloween and Texas Chainsaw Massacre, horror audiences simply weren't accustomed to seeing truly horrific films. The often outlandish posters made sensationalist promises that were seldom met, and Watkins seemingly knew this. He didn't want to make a fun romp of a movie, he wanted a product with no limits that would genuinely disturb and scare the viewers. With the seed planted, he began recruiting people to help out with production. He commissioned the cast from the university's theatre department and planned to use an abandoned on-site building as the main location. He even managed to convince professor and film historian Paul Jensen to play a small role in a scene directly inspired by the murder of Gary Hinman. Being a student with limited resources, the budget was to be a minuscule $3,000 that Watkins borrowed from his father more than two-thirds of which, the director later admitted, was spent on fueling his addiction to amphetamine. But this would arguably be a contributing factor to generating the manic intensity he seemed so determined to create. And so, armed with only a few friends, colleagues, an empty building and a film camera, Roger set about making the film, which by this time had turned into something much more than a simple retread of the Manson family crimes. With the working title and at the hour of our death, the film was to concern a man, Terry Hawkins, recently released from prison on drugs charges. Having previously made porn films that didn't sell, Terry becomes convinced that people's tastes are evolving to something much more extreme, and so he gathers together some associates with the intention to produce genuine snuff movies, not only to sell, but to take revenge on the society that he believes has wronged him. The story still used elements from the Sanders biography, namely the snuff rumours and the group of misfits that echoed the family, but it became almost poetically meta, as Watkins, much like the main character he plays in the film, was a man trying, under difficult circumstances, to produce something radically different to satisfy an increasingly desensitised audience. Despite being produced very quickly, it's evident that Watkins wasn't conservative with his film stock, as the director's final cut, now titled The Cuckoo Clocks of Hell, as a reference to Kurt Vonnegut's novel Mother Night, reportedly came in at no less than three hours in length, a gruelling runtime for any film, let alone one as unflinchingly nihilistic as this one. Watkins managed to arrange a meeting with Francis Ford Coppola, who told Watkins about a reasonably cheap studio where he could get the film dubbed. This initial version was screened to cast, crew and family, and according to Watkins was shown publicly, causing riots at showings in New York and Chicago, although outside of Watkins' recollections 30 years after the fact, 
There's seemingly no evidence of this version ever being screened publicly at all, let alone causing violence. Sometime in the mid-70s, Roger would return to re-edit the film, making substantial cuts totalling about one hour, but this would still prove too much for distributors, who finally picked the film up in 1977, after various delays getting a release of any sort. It was once again reduced, this time to 77 minutes, redubbed and retitled The Fun House, and this cut is the only one available at the time of writing, as both of Watkins' much longer versions are considered lost. Little is known about the changes made, but according to the director, it omits 20 minutes of genuine slaughterhouse footage, while the final and infamous third act remains almost entirely intact. There's also a wholly unnecessary and inexplicable voiceover added in at the end, which does somewhat detract from the intended atmosphere. Terence Hawkins, Kenneth Hardy, Catherine Hughes, Patricia Kuhn, and William Drexel were all later apprehended, and are now serving a 999-year sentence in the state penitentiary. This third-party cut was made without Watkins' knowledge, and he didn't muddle his words when he came to his feelings on it. He felt that his work had been butchered and was now largely incoherent, and says some deeply unpleasant things about editor Bernie Travis on a later audio commentary. But I digress. This time there is evidence of the funhouse being screened at various cinemas and drive-ins across the country. While I was unable to locate any print reviews from this time, the picture is clearly seen as the main attraction in any adverts for double and triple bills, which does suggest that the film harboured a certain level of notoriety, and given how much more extreme the film is than those it was shown alongside, we can make an educated guess at audience response. Something interesting to note at this stage is that another film, also titled The Fun House, was featured in the Director of Public Prosecutions list of so-called video nasties, movies that were eligible for prosecution in the UK under the Obscene Publications Act in the early 1980s. The film actually listed is a relatively inoffensive slasher from Toby Hooper, so it does make you wonder if rumour had spread across the Atlantic about just how horrifying Watkins' movie was, and Hooper's film was merely swept up in the confusion. This has been often suggested, but is difficult to prove in any capacity, especially as Watkins' film seemingly didn't have any UK release until it was passed uncut with an 18 certificate for a DVD release in 2006. The final major change came in 1979, when the Cinematic Releasing Corporation acquired the rights and re-released it under its most common title, The Last House on Dead End Street, clearly cashing in on the success of Wes Craven's 1972 film, The Last House on the Left, and even using that film's classic tagline on the poster, and in a short, completely inappropriate advertisement. It's only a movie. It's only a movie. Remember, it's only a movie. Last House on Dead End Street. Rated R. The film by no means reached the heights of the Craven film, but its status as something of an urban legend began around this time. In the context of the period, I find it hard to think of another film that equaled Last House on Dead End Street when it comes to just how disturbing and visceral it is, so it's no wonder that it became something of a holy grail for fans of elusive and underground movies. For one, its home video releases from Sun Video were painfully limited and half of them heavily censored, so copies were consequently incredibly hard to track down meaning those that hadn't seen it only had word of mouth to go on. And if Bill Landis' description of people being, quote, stunned and sickened but unable to leave their seats from a 1979 New York screening is anything to go by, then people's retellings would be nothing if not colourful. Add on top of that the fact that all of the music is stock music and that every credit is a pseudonym, and you get quite the intriguing picture. In a throwback to the Manson case, there were even rumours that this itself was a snuff film that depicted real murders, owing to the fact that nobody knew who the director was, nobody knew any of the people involved, and the final 30 minutes depict some of the most convincing and unsettling scenes ever put to film. There was reportedly even hearsay that this was produced by the Mexican Mafia because of the directorial pseudonym Victor Janos. As time went on, the movie continued to gain attention from horror fans, and increasingly bizarre rumours continued to circulate. It wasn't until around 25 years after its initial conception that new information would arise, when the uncut 77-minute version was inexplicably aired on Venezuelan television. On top of this, someone just so happened to be recording it, which paved the way for an unofficial bootleg of the film to begin doing the rounds among those determined enough to track it down. It was around this time in 1989 that film critic Chaz Ballon wrote a review for the film in the Deep Red Horror Handbook, in which he successfully identified the director as, quote, a young New York film student named Roger Watkins. 
He discovered this after receiving a letter from a fan containing the long sought after information, although it's still unknown how the fan found this out. But it is the first documented time of Watkins' name being linked to either of the film's titles. This was later verified in 2000 when the man himself came forward on an online cult movie forum and revealed that he was in fact the director. And I couldn't believe it. I mean, I couldn't believe the response. I couldn't believe the message boards that go up all over the place. Within a month or two, if you go to Google, there's three or four or five pages sometimes of listings for Last House on Dead End Street. I was, I was, I couldn't believe it. Between 2000 and his untimely death in 2007, Watkins participated in the recording of several commentaries and interviews in which he dispelled all the rumours and admitted that this was nothing more than an experimental student film that drew attention through shock and circumstance. Fortunately, he did live long enough to see the admittedly rough cut make it onto home media in 2002 for a release that he himself was heavily involved with. And the screenplay for a sequel was even penned in 2005 by Andrew Kopp, but this was never made owing to Watkins' unfortunate passing in 2007, aged 58. Speaking in 2021, The Last House on Dead End Street is still an incredibly evocative and powerful experience. People's opinions seem to differ wildly, some calling it a masterpiece of shock, others deeming it a failure. But it's widely accepted that despite its inevitable technical shortfalls, the film is worth viewing at least once, even if only for the credit of seeing it. On a personal level, I find the film absolutely fascinating. It manages to create a palpable sense of dread and unease, the likes of which I'm yet to find in another movie. Speaking honestly, the first portion of the movie has very few redeeming qualities, as the choppy editing and other flaws are at their worst here. But it's worth wading through simply for what waits on the other side. A final 30 minutes which have gone down in history as some of the most deranged, nihilistic, distressing and frightening images ever put to film. The film is clearly very cine-literate, with its various metafilm qualities being some of its more interesting themes. References to classic films are abound here, be it posters for Dracula or The Psychopath, directed by Freddie Francis, whom Watkins met after camping out on his front lawn for a day. The masks, which, as well as serving to make dubbing easier, also act as an eyes without a face reference. The use of blackface and the hunchback, Watkins credits as being a reference to Al Jolson and Charles Lawton's performance as Quasimodo in the 1939 adaptation of The Hunchback of Notre Dame. And perhaps most interestingly, a scene sadly cut from the current version, which would have featured one of the victims in a hallucinatory state, running from his pursuers through their abandoned hideout, only to find themselves in an exact replica of their home, intentionally echoing the ending of Stanley Kubrick's 2001 A Space Odyssey. If, after all of this, you still want to watch it, it's more available now than ever before, even having a 2K high-definition print on Vinegar Syndrome's release of Roger's 1983 film Corruption. The same label have reportedly been working on a standalone Blu-ray release since 2015, but word on this has since fallen silent. The final piece of the puzzle is whether or not the three-hour Cuckoo Clocks of Hell cut still exists. The general consensus is unfortunately not. Roger himself did believe that the cut footage may still be in the hands of the distributor, however it's just as possible that this was discarded after the edits were made. But who knows? Maybe in some dark and dingy film vault, it lies waiting to be discovered. But nonetheless, it's a testament to the film's legacy that even 50 years after its creation, the mystery of The Last House on Dead End Street still has people talking.